Hello everybody, this is David. Welcome back to my channel. This video is the next in our series, The Christian Epic in the 21st Century. And we're going to begin to look at how the Judeo-Christian Epic outworks itself in our lives. How does it show itself? What should our attitudes and our outlooks be towards certain things in our lives? And in this video, I want to begin to look at what the teaching of the New Testament is about work. Work. Is it a curse or is it a blessing? Which one is it? So if you're ready, let's continue. So here are two poems with precisely opposite ideas about work. So the first one is four lines of a funny poem which were written by a labourer who was very tired and who was dying and this is how it goes don't pity me now don't pity me never i'm going to do nothing forever and ever so the one thing in the world of this person wanted was to be done forever with work now samuel johnson who was an english writer in the 1700s said this and I quote, we would all be idle if we could, end of quote. But here is Rud Rudyard Kipling's dream of what he wanted when life had ended. And this is what he said. When Earth's last picture is painted and the tubes are twisted and dried, when the oldest colours are faded and the youngest cricket critic has died, we shall rest and faith we shall need it lie down for an aeon or two till the master of all good workmen shall put us to work anew and those that were good shall be happy they shall sit in a golden chair they shall splash at a tenly canvas with brushes of comets hair they shall find real saints to draw from Maudlin, Peter and Paul, they shall work for an age at a, at a sitting and never grow tired at all. And only the master shall praise us and only the master shall blame. And none shall work for money and no one shall work for fame. But each for the joy of the working and each in his separate star shall draw the thing as he sees it. For the God of things as they are. So here are two opposite points of view. Now in one case the end of life is the end of work and thank God. In the other case the end of life is the opportunity to work as never before and praise God. Now it so happens that these two points of view can both be found in the Bible though not with equal emphasis. The end of the story in Genesis is that Adam and Eve were forever shut out of the garden and the condemnation is in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread as we read in the book of Genesis chapter 3 verses 17 to 19. Now the idea is that if man had not sinned he would have lived forever in the sun-kissed paradise with nothing to do but to enjoy the garden. On the other hand, almost the whole Bible, apart from this story, bases its entire thought on the teaching and the assumption that man, humanity, is meant to work and to work honourably and well. There is nothing better, said the preacher, than that a man should enjoy his work, as we read in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Verse 22. Now, in the teachings of Jesus, parable after parable is based on the fact that a good servant must be a good workman. The Apostle Paul was, was quite clear that if a man refused to work, he had no right to eat, as we read in the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 10. And it was his own claim and his own boast that he supported himself with his own two hands 
and took nothing from anyone, as we read in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9 and the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 8. And there is the astonishing case of Jesus himself. Jesus was no less than 30 years of age when he emerged into public life, as we read in Luke chapter 3 verse 23. It was as the carpenter of Nazareth that people knew him, as we read in the book of Mark chapter 6 verse 2. So for 30 of his 33 years on earth, he was a village workman. Actually, it was less than that because, because of childhood and school. But Jesus began by being a working man. Now, this was one of the basic differences between the Jewish and the Greek and Roman world. To the Jews, work was essential. Work was of the essence of life. The Jews had a saying that he who does not teach his son a trade teaches him to steal. Now, a Jewish rabbi was the equivalent of a college lecturer or professor, but according to the Jewish law, he must not take a penny for teaching. He must have a trade at which he worked with his hands and by which he supported himself. So they were rabbis who were tailors and shoemakers and barbers and bakers and even perfumers. Work to a Jew was life. But the Greek and Roman civilizations were based on slavery. According to Plato, no artisan or working man could be a citizen of that state, of the ideal state. Aristotle tells us that in Thebes, no man could become a citizen until 10 years after he had stopped working at a trade. Cicero said that no gentleman will work for a wage. No gentleman would either buy or sell, either wholesale or retail. No workshop can have any culture about it, is what he said. Now, unquestionably, the Christian tradition came from the Jewish tradition, out of the cradle. Work for the Jew and for the Christian is the making of life. Work and life are the same thing. So we can begin by saying certain quite general things about work. Let's have a look, shall we? Firstly, our work is what we are and where we are. Now, there is nothing more common than for a person that to wish that their work was something other than what it was, than what it actually is. So the worker in an industry or in a factory or a warehouse might wish to be a minister or a doctor. And there are times when the minister and the doctor cover enviously a job that begins at nine and finishes at 5.30 instead of a job that goes on for 24 hours a day. Robert Carlyle was one of Scotland's great thinkers and writers. He lived in the uh, 1800s. He was born in the 1795 but lived until 1881. His father was a stonemason and a famous builder of bridges. And Thomas Carlyle used to say that he would rather have built one of his father's bridges than written all his own books. So there was a famous Jewish rabbi called Susha. Sometimes he used to wish that he, he was other than what he was. And then he said very wisely, In the world to come, they will not ask me, why were you not Moses? They will ask, why were you not Susia? A man's duty is literally to be himself. So there is a poem that uh, was written by uh, a girl of 19 years of age, and we don't know her name, but this is what she wrote. Lord of all pots and pans and things, since I've no time to be a saint by doing lovely things, 
or watching late with thee, or dreaming in the dawnlight, or storming's heaven's gates, make me a saint by getting meals and washing up the plates. Thou who did love to give men food in, in room or by the sea, accept this service that I do, I do it unto thee. So then our work is first and foremost what we are and where we are. That is not to say that no person ought to change their job or want another job, but it is to say that the best way to a greater job is to do the one we have supremely well. Now it is a strange paradox that the person who gets the, the, the greater job is the person who is so intensely interested in what they are currently doing that they do not think of any other job. Now secondly, the New Testament is quite sure that there is no better test of a person than in the way in which they work. Again and again, this is the key point of the parables of Jesus. All that a person has to show God is their work. And that does not mean what they have done so much as how they did it. Now, there is a story of an old Irish navvy who used to work on the construction of railways long before the days of mechanical shovers, shovels and bulldozers and excavators in the days when all they had was a shovel and a barrow. The old navvy's spade was so well used that it shone like stainless steel when he cleaned the mud off it at night. Someone, someone once asked him jokingly, well Paddy, what will you do when you die and when God asks you what you shall have to save for yourself? I think, said Paddy, that I'll just show him my spade. Now, L.P. Jacks was the author of many books and he wrote his manu manuscripts by hand. Now, when he wrote, he always wore an old tweed jacket and the right cuff of the jacket was worn away with rubbing against the desk as he wrote. Now, Regarding the story that I've just said, this is what he commented. If it comes to that, I think I'll show God the cuff of my jacket. So work is the test, not the importance of the work from the prestige point of view, but the faithfulness with which it is done. Now, it is truly been said that God does not so much need people to do extraordinary things as he needs people who do ordinary things extraordinarily well. So thirdly, the test of a person is work. And we can put that in another way. The test of a worker is, do they earn their pay? Or to put it better, do they try to earn their pay? Now, there have been times in this country, and I'm sure in other countries too, when we have come perilously close to situations in which people, working people, are thinking not of earning their pay, but get, of getting more and more pay for less and less work. Think of the um, industrial disputes of the 70s and 80s in this country in particular, and you know, throughout history, there's been uh, disputes where people wanted to do less but get paid more. Now, if this was an ideal world, we will all be more interested in the quality of the work we produce than in the pay we got for it. Now, it is hardly possible to rise to that height except for the creative artists whose work is a thing of the spirit. That is, you know, getting paid a lot for hardly anything. You know, the painter gets paid a lot for his painting. But there have been sages in the past when the right to be paid is demanded. When the right to demand, sorry, when the right to bargain for more is demanded. 
when the right to take action for the highest possible pay is demanded and when the obligation to earn that pay is rarely admitted. Rudyard Kipling wrote this poem. From forge and farm and mine and bench, deck altar, outpost loan, mill, school, battalion, counter, trench, rail, senate, sheepfold, throne, creation's cry goes up on high, from age to cheated age, send us the men who do the work for which they drew the wage. So fourthly, there is one thing which would go far to make work what it ought to be and to cause it to be done in the spirit in which it ought to be done. And that is if we can look at our work as a contribution owed to the community. I think we'll stop the video there and we'll continue that in the next video. So I want to thank you for joining me in this video and we'll come back in the next one. Thank you. Bye bye.